Film school will show you groundbreaking classics. But there are a lot of films that I think I'd add to that list. Of course, this is totally subjective and just from my weird little brain, but oh boy, have I got some great films to share with you. Did I mention this is just my way of showing you films that I like? Anyways, yeah, I'm gonna talk about The Stupids. The Stupids is a scathing satirical family film that happens to take place in a very strange timeline known as pre-9-11 America. There's so much that I love about this movie. It punches up, which is very refreshing, and it exudes joy. So now, just like a great teacher, I'm going to give you 10 arbitrary reasons why I would show this film in a film class. The Inciting Incident. Oh dear. Oh no. Someone's stolen our garbage again. This is possibly the most insignificant inciting incident in film history. A confused, self-important father proclaims that he's had enough and he finally gets to be a hero. Oh, Stanley, please don't get involved. I already am involved, Joan. Someone has stolen from my family and I will not rest until I bring them to justice. This random event sets off a long chain of random events, flimsily connected by an absurd plot suggesting that life itself is a long chain of random events, which we flimsily connect with ideology and a desperate need for meaning. But also, Stanley's opening monologue is ripped straight from the kind of self-important, close-minded, tough guy rhetoric that flooded conservative talk radio stations in the 90s. It's the world we live in today. There are people out there for whom nothing is sacred. Whoever keeps doing this knows that people like us will just sit back and take it. Darn it, I'm not gonna take it anymore. Whoa, I must be reading way too much into this already. It's gotta be just a meaningless comedy. One that's filled with all these jokes that I've heard so much about. You know, the ones that are totally apolitical. <laughs> I'm sure there won't be any blatant references to 90s conservative talk radio in this movie. Lady parts, not that kind. This film stands out for having fantastic comedic parts for women. Too often, comedies save all the comedy for the men. But here, mother and daughter are just as comedic as father and son. Jessica Lundy and Alex McKenna get to be loud, obnoxious, and, well, as stupid as their male counterparts. What have you got in mind, Petunia? A little ride on the information superhighway, Mom. Physical comedy is something that I personally love from growing up watching The Three Stooges. And if women rarely get to be funny, <gasps> It is extra rare that we get to be physically funny. The Military Industrial Complex, a comedy. Oh, is that a Rush Limbaugh book I see you reading, Mr. Military Man? As much as it pains me to say that a director whose last name is Landis predicted the future, it's shocking how much this arms-dealing general looks, acts, and talks like disgraced General Mike Flynn. But I can't help wondering what our country would think of what we're doing. I gave my life to the military. Nothing's gonna stop me from getting something back. This portrayal of the military is just another one of the many things that seem delightfully absurd to a kid watching this movie in the 90s, but it's painfully real watching it now, 20 years later. Hey, it's almost as if the relationship between the military and capitalism is a horrible scourge that's a threat to democracy not only abroad, but here in the United States too. Christianity is silly. When Stanley and his daughter Petunia stumble into the planetarium, they mistake the stars for heaven and assume that they're dead. So this is heaven. And when they meet a stranger in the planetarium, Somebody in here? They make a big assumption. It's time to meet our creator. As a kid, this made me giggle to no end, but now that I'm older, I realize it's a commentary on the superficiality of many religious people. Hail to thee, O Lord. Actually, it's pronounced Lloyd. All these years we've been saying it wrong. And the way that American Christianity discourages spiritual curiosity, favoring the most banal, simplistic reading of the universe, which happens to center meaning around the intellectually lazy white guy. Is heaven another dimension? Another plane of existence where our non-corporeal bodies will float into the ether? Nope, it must be just another room that I, a confused American, walk into. Conspiracy theory ding-dongs. We learn that in the past, when Stanley worked at the post office, he started developing a conspiracy theory around a man named Sender. One of my favorite scenes in the film is when Mr. Stupid finally connects all of the dots for himself. Sender. 
And while it is a hilarious scene because of how wrong he is, his passion is remarkable. Obviously, this kind of mid-90s anti-government conspiracy theory mumbo-jumbo is very similar to current-day conspiracy theory stuff like people who think pizza places aren't pizza places or that random numbers and letters posted on Twitter are a magic decoder ring. It's almost as if Stanley Stupid in his red, white, and blue outfits is a perfect parody of the out-of-touch suburban American voter. The Bush Joke Any good spy movie includes a scene where the hero has to steal someone's identity or wear prosthetics to impersonate someone and infiltrate an evil organization. For Stanley, that means... Camouflage lesson number one. To look like a bush, you have to think like a bush. And of course, Stanley gets carried away in his own performance. Wait a minute, what's this? I have arms. I am a bush with arms and legs. I am the first bush in history with legs. I have no other point other than that this joke has been so influential to me as a writer and actor, and I hope to commit to everything as hard as Tom Arnold commits to this bit. And half an hour later, we get one of the most on-the-nose yet hilarious callbacks in film history. No one suspects a thing, Mr. Cinder, unless that bush has ears. <laughs> The joke's on you, my friends. The color palette. I love color. I love it. I love putting it on my face, wearing it on my body, decorating my bookshelf with as many pops of color as I can cram in. And this film beautifully utilizes color. It creates a separation between the world of the stupids and the real world. The film also came out before the 2000s, when films became depressingly gray. One is not better than the other, and clearly the grayscale of many of the films was a reaction to the emotional trauma of 9-11. As a personal preference, I think color can be such a great storytelling element on its own. And if Into the Spider-Verse is any indicator, maybe we're heading back into the trend of colorful movies. Aliens after a random series of events that leads to this newspaper headline accidentally getting printed, a couple of alien pilots take offense and swear revenge. We see that even our most seemingly inconsequential actions have unpredictable ramifications, much like a butterfly flapping its wings in Central Park, or the president starting a war that we don't need to be fighting, or you know how one man thinking his garbage is being stolen helps take down an arms deal. Maybe the whole plot of the stupids is absurd. Or maybe every plot is simply a random series of events that we string together in our minds to form some kind of cohesive narrative because we're terrified of the alternative, that life really is a series of random, meaningless events and we have no control over our own destinies. Does the fact that Stanley defeats the aliens entirely by random chance support this thesis? To find the answer, just print out a bunch of random words at home put them in a bag, and pull them out in a random order to string together a sentence. Whatever that sentence says is the answer. Speaking of random, I have two ideas for number nine, and you can just pick which one you like more. 9A, spoof of the American family. This film is a clear spoof of the obliviousness of the modern American family, and how larger powers often take advantage of that. It satirizes everything from our military industrial complex to cable television. Well, maybe you'd all be happier if there was no primetime television. I like a good old spoof, but it also says a lot seeing what the filmmakers choose to spoof. There is a chasm of difference between spoofing horror movies and spoofing real problems in society. Both have their place, but one says a heck of a lot more. 9B, Buster goes mad with power. After Buster and his mom use an elevator they mistake for a time machine, he writes his name on what he thinks is a prehistoric wall. So much of this movie is about the absurd ways we construct meaning in society. And here, Buster thinks he's found the ultimate way to rearrange society, centering all power around himself. Life on Earth will be nothing but a footnote to Buster. We gotta get out of here. Hmm, a young white boy with delusions of grandeur, with dreams of dominating society as a power-mad dictator. Can't think of any connection to contemporary society there. Oh well, guess we'll move on. Practical effects. 
refreshing. There's a heck of a lot of practical effects in The Stupids, but there's one that really exemplifies a type of comedy that basically doesn't exist in live action movies anymore. It's a very cartoony gag, and seeing it done practically is a real treat. Nowadays, this shot would probably be composited from a bunch of different elements, but there's a real physicality and texture to doing it for realsies. Let's take a deep breath and enjoy this part of film history. So that's it! 10-ish reasons why I wish they would have talked about the stupids in film class. Now you can go out into the world a smarter or stupider person. Thanks for watching! If you want to see more videos like this, plus more of my longer, in-depth film analysis videos, you can support me on Patreon. Big thanks to all my patrons who've helped me make these videos. I couldn't do it without you! Thank the Lloyd and save Martha. Bye bye The joke's on you, my friends.